Yeah, they figured out a way to make money off of it. All right, so um, last week we got uh, kind of cut off early, right? With the, with the weather or no, whatever happened, the power outage. So um, that set us back about, what it was in about an hour we lost there. So um, I've been throwing some ideas around because we're supposed to have our test on Wednesday, right? So I've been throwing some ideas around because we are, we're also scheduled for that following week to be the week where you do the um, video stuff. So I just thought I'd throw this out here for you all to consider. Um, I thought maybe what we would do is, is make the exam a week from today, which would mean next Monday you would come in and take the test. And then you would only have the Wednesday that you do the video. So really, we would only have one day of video. Um, that would allow me to finish up the quadratics that we're going to do today and then get into the polynomial and rational functions um, throughout the rest of the week. And then we would take that test on Monday. And then Wednesday, you would do the video. And then when we come back, we only have two days. right? So I'm, I'm kind of in a little bit of a tight spot here. Um, what do y'all think of that so far? Is this, eh, is this sounding okay? It would be, it would be, so basically today, right, we would do um, quadratics, we'd finish that up, we would do polynomials, and we would maybe start rationals, I don't think so, but rational. And then Wednesday this week, we would, we would continue this probably this part right here, right? And then Monday of next week, you would have exam two, all right? And I think it would only go uh, through the polynomials, which I think I told you, you would probably prefer to have this on the test, okay? So rationals would not be included on the test on Monday. So pretty much, what we, what we, when we finish polynomials today, that's the only thing you'll be responsible for a week from today. So it gives you some time to prepare for that. So Monday, uh, we do the exam next week. And then Wednesday, we do um, the at-home thing, right? At home. And this is going to cover <coughs> exponentials and logs. All right. And then we come back on that Monday. Sorry, I can't spell today. can't spell any day, but when we come back Monday, we're supposed to have one more class period. And then that Wednesday, I believe we're supposed to have exam three. Is that what's on the schedule? I might have that backwards. Hold on. We're supposed to have three exams. Oh, so Monday, we're supposed to actually have that exam three here. Which, you see, this is why I want to talk to you about this, because this doesn't seem possible. I mean, if we have an exam on Monday, right, then you do an at-home video, what are you going to have an exam on, you know? An at-home video? No, I'm not going to do that to you. So here's what I was thinking, all right? Is Monday, we do more lecture, okay? I'm not sure what we'll cover. Wednesday, we'll do more lecture and uh, review for the final, right? Or is the... Yeah, hold on. No, just more, more lecture. Sorry. Let me see if I'm getting this right. Okay. Try to break this up into weeks. So we have today's the 9th, right? This would be the 11th. This would be the 16th. This would be the 18th. Then 23rd. Yeah, this is, this is the last day right here. 25th. So this is the final. You see why I'm feeling like we have an issue? Yes? Okay. So here's what I was thinking. We push this exam just like this, all right? And what we do is we do an, an at-home, like a take-home exam for exam three, all right? That would basically replace your lowest exam. So this is kind of a, this is like a packaged gift for you, all right? <laughs> so like, you're going to have exam one, we've already done that, right? Whatever your grade was. Exam two, we're going to take, we'll take it, what, next Monday? Then I'll give you a, a take-home exam, 
And that, that take-home exam will just cover stuff we've done. I'm not going to sit here and give you a review for a take-home exam. You just have to go home and figure it out, right? So you do that take-home exam. I take that grade and I replace either exam two or exam one with that if it's higher than exam two or one and one. If you're happy with exam two and one, you don't even have to do the take-home. Does that make sense? And then we'll have, to, we'll have to have a final. We have to have a final. So we'll do a final and that final, I will review for that final. Does that kind of make sense? What do you all think about that? I hate that we keep having to change course, but um, there's just no way I can squeeze in a third exam in here, reasonably. All right? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to send out an email. I'm probably going to have to go, I like to make it official, all right? So I'll do that probably later today. That way everyone is aware of what's going on. All right? Okay. All right, I like that idea because then I only have to worry about one day of you watching videos. All right, let's talk about quadratics. We, the last problem we did was the... We were doing the World Trade Center problem, right? Oh, and the videos for those are up online. Um, the, the, it was two videos. One of them I put up last week. And then the other video got kind of corrupted a little bit when the camera lost power. But I was able to recover the video, and I think it, it shows the whole thing. So those are, um, those are up on YouTube now, all right? <clears throat> So what do you say we start by kind of refreshing what we were doing by actually graphing? Let's do a graphing problem. You want to do a graphing or you want to do a word problem? You want to do a word? Okay, we can do a word problem. Because the difference really between the graphing and the word problem is that the graphing you have to go through all those steps, right? The word problem you don't necessarily need to draw a picture. So um, let's do a word, a word problem. And... I kind of want to make one up. All right, so here's an example here. A helicopter is ascending at, uh, let's say, 12 feet per second. When it is 400 feet high, it drops a body. No, we'll do something different. It drops a uh, bomb, OK. That's more pleasant. Okay, it drops a bomb. Right? So, I'm going to ask you some questions now, but let's just get kind of a visual of what's happening here. If the helicopter is just sitting here stationary, right, if it was at 400 feet high and it drops a bomb, then the bomb's just going to fall, right? But because the helicopter is actually ascending, it's, it's moving up, when it drops the bomb, when it lets go, the bomb actually goes up a little bit, okay? It's almost like somebody's throwing something up in the air because it already has motion vertically. So it releases the bomb, it goes, bomb goes up a little bit and then starts to come back down. So what, what I'm gonna ask you is, what is the maximum height, let's call this part A, what is maximum height of the bomb. When does it reach its max height? And finally, when does it kaboom? When does it hit the ground, right? We're assuming that the bomb, I think that's the way you spell kaboom. 
We're assuming that the bomb actually is going to, to detonate when it hits the ground, right? They have some of those, what, air burst bombs that blow up above ground, cause a little more damage to people on the ground. All right, understand the question? If you look back at um, the first problem I gave you where we threw a rock in the air, this is pretty much the same problem, and I'm actually asking you the same questions. It's just kind of hidden in different wording. All right, so what do we need to do this problem? We need a formula, don't we? And that formula I've given to you, d of t equals negative 16 t squared plus v naught t plus d naught. Okay, so that formula we need. And we need to identify the different pieces of that formula, plug things in, and then start working the math. So do we know what this number is right here in our formula? What's that? I, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, remember there's, there's two things that we have to, to determine in our formula. We have to determine what V-naught is, and that is your initial speed, and then D-naught, which is your initial height. All right, those are the two things. If you look back in your notes, those are the two um, elements of the formula that we, we need to determine before we can start using the formula. So this says 12 feet per second. That's a measurement of speed, isn't it? 12 feet per second. So this is your V naught. Now the thing you have to consider is whether or not you're going to use plus 12 or minus 12. And how do you determine if, if it's plus 12 or minus 12? Yeah, if, if, if it's going up, right? Remember, if the ball was thrown up, then it would be a positive number. If it's down, it's negative. In this case, the helicopter is moving up, right? Ascending. So it's moving up. If this said descending, we would be wanting to use negative 12. Understand? Okay, so I know that V-naught is going to be positive 12. And then the 400 feet, this is the height, right? This is the height of the bomb when it's released. So this is our D-naught. So the formula that we'll use for this problem looks like this. So I'm not answering any questions yet, right? I'm just writing down the formula. D of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 12 t plus 400. Okay, that is the, the master formula that I need. <clears throat> for this particular bomb, this is the formula or the equation that we need to use. All right, any questions on that part? Okay, how do we answer part A? What is, it, what is part A asking for? Okay, it's asking for the maximum height. So think about a picture. When the bomb is released, right, at time is zero. At time is zero, shouldn't the bomb be 400 feet high? And then as time goes on, what's going to happen to this height? It should go down, but what does it do first? It goes up a little bit, right? It goes up a little bit, and then it's going to come back down. That's because the helicopter had given it some motion vertically. So it's going to go up and then come back down and hit the ground. This point right here is the answer to which part, A, B, or C? This is part C, right? This is actually, when we figure this time out, that's going to be the answer to part C. This point right here has two pieces of information in it. It has the x-coordinate, or in this case the t-coordinate, which is the h, that tells you the left or right, and then the k, which tells you the up and down, right? So for part a, what am I looking for? Am I looking for h or k, or both, or what? So what is the maximum height, right? What is the height of the bomb? This is height, isn't it? This is time. So part A is saying, what is this maximum height? So it wants this coordinate, the Y coordinate of the point. Does that make sense? You sure? Okay. So this right here, K, is gonna be the answer to part A. 
And then H is this right here, which is the time, right? And that's the answer to this one. When? When does it reach the maximum height? That's a measurement of time. So that goes here. And then we already said that this was the answer to part C. So at the end of the day, what this comes down to is this. We have to find the vertex, don't we? And we have to find the x-intercepts. And once we do that, we're done. I told you last time to be careful because sometimes on tests, I ask this question first. I put when does it reach its maximum height? And then the second question I ask, what is the maximum height? So I flip them in the questioning on the test. So don't just go into the test saying, oh, the answer to the first one is K, the answer to the second one is H. You have to actually read the question, all right? And who knows, I could put this one first. It, it doesn't matter, right? It could be any order. All right, so how do we find the vertex? If we're, gonna, if we're actually going to find this point right here, how do we do it? H equals negative B over Okay, good. We have a formula for H. H is negative B over 2A. All right, that's a formula I gave you in class. So for us, we never did this, but if we identify A is negative 16, right? B is positive 12, and C is positive 400. So we're just going to plug these into this. So what is, what is this going to become? What's negative B for us? Negative 12 over 2 times negative 16, right? And we'll probably need to get our calculators out for this to get a nice decimal answer. Point three seven five. Now while we're here, let's go ahead and get K. So to get K, all we do to this, all we do to get K is what? Substitute. Take that number that we just got, substitute it back in here for T. All right, we're going to replace our T's with that. So really what we're doing is we're taking the function D and we're plugging in 0.375. And so we're doing negative 16 times 0.375 squared plus 12 times 0.375 and plus 400. And so you've got to get your calculator out and make sure you get all this right. I'll kind of do this, uh, I'm running out of room here. I'll do it right underneath this. This is equal to these, these together right here. I'm getting negative 2.25 plus, that should be double that. So 4.5 and then plus 400, which should equal 402. 0.25. Questions? So can we answer the, uh, the first questions, the first two? Yes, so what is the maximum height of the ball? 402.5 feet, uh, 25, sorry, 0.25. So like I said, because the helicopter is moving up, when it releases the bomb, the bomb's going to come up a little bit. It actually comes up 2.25 feet. Then it starts its drop. And then how about part B? When does it reach its maximum height? So 0.375 seconds. 0.375 seconds. So it's like just, just a little bit over a third of a second, it's, it's, it ri it's rising, okay? So you let it go for about 0.375 se seconds, it's rising, reaches its maximum height of 402.25 and then starts to drop. So finally, the last question, when does it hit the ground, you kind of throw these, for these away, right? You don't need these anymore. And now we're going to turn to what to get, to get where it hits the ground. 
How do we find that point? The x-intercepts, right? And to do that, we're going to have to use the quadratic formula on that, unless you can factor it, but I doubt any of these word problems are going to factor. So I'm just going to go straight to the quadratic formula on this. And notice the way I write my quadratic formula here. I'm going to go t equals negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So I, I'm just saying, notice that I use t instead of x. And that's because the variable in the problem is t, right? Not x. But it's the same formula. So we're going to go t equals negative 12 plus or minus the square root of 12 squared, which is 144, minus 4 times negative 16 times 400, oops, all over 2 times <coughs> negative 16. Was this what you were referring to that you are having issues with? Okay. Are you okay with the setup of it? Like we're plugging all the numbers in? Okay. So, okay, so I've taught students different ways of doing this. And so the way I've shown you all so far is I've said cover up that minus sign and then figure out what these three numbers are. Okay, so if we did that, let's just think about if it would be positive or negative. This would be positive times a negative, which would be negative, right? Times a positive would be still negative. But then you're going to be subtracting it. So it's going to turn it to positive, right? That's one way to look at it. All right. Another way to look at it is less, there's less thinking involved, but it, sometimes it's easier. And that's, this time, don't cover this up, okay? Just count how many negatives you see, okay? You see two. If you see an even number of negatives, it's positive. If you see an odd number of negatives, it's going to be negative. So like, for example, if this would have been positive 16, you see one negative, right? Yeah. That's an odd number, so it's going to be negative. If you see negative, negative, and that was negative, now you see three, right? That's odd, so you're going to be negative. Okay. Make sense? Makes sense. Okay. okay. But that's the one we're working with, right? Just like this. So we're going to have a positive under there. So let's go ahead and do that. We have t equals uh, negative 12 plus or minus the square root 144. And we said it's going to be plus. And then did someone do this already, just these three together? I believe you, but let me. Oh, I already, I already uh, added the work. Okay, yeah, this is, uh, this is 2, 5, 6, 0, 0, and then all over negative 32. Okay, so those three numbers together gives you 25,600. Then you add that to 144. So this equals negative 12 plus or minus the square root of 25. 744 all over negative 32 and that equals now you have to actually take your square root so on your calculator make sure you can do this 160.4 160.5 I told you I don't really care how close you get this just one decimal place I'm gonna go 0.4 So just make sure that on the next step, you don't do anything with this 32 yet. You do all of this first, which means we're going to have two different, two different things to look at, the plus and the minus. So if I do negative 12 plus 160.4 over negative 32, I'm going to get something. If I do negative 12 minus 160.4 over negative 32, I'm going to get something else. So c can somebody tell me without actually doing the calculation whether or not this is going to be a positive or negative answer right here? It's going to be negative because look, negative 12 plus 160, isn't that a positive number? And you're dividing it by a negative number. That's going to be a negative number. And that means I don't care about this answer because it's time, right? And this is going to represent negative time. So I can actually just kind of chunk this one without actually doing the computation. All right. Now, if you want to do it, do it, but 
This one though, negative 12 take away 160.4, it's gonna be negative and then over negative that's gonna be positive. So I need that one. Now what happens if both your answers are negative? What if you get two answers that are negative here? You did something wrong. Because this, this bomb should hit the ground, right? At some, some point in time. So 5.3875 is what I'm getting. Again, we can round this 5.4 if you want. And this is the only answer that makes sense. So what is the answer to part C? 5.38 seconds, right? This is a measurement of time. So from when that helicopter releases the bomb, it's going to take about 5.4 seconds for it to hit the ground. 5.4 seconds. Okay. That's all right. Any other questions over something like this? All right, so do we want to graph a quadratic or do we want to move on to polynomials? Do y'all want to do one graphing one? Okay, do one graphing. I'll work kind of fast though, okay, because we've done, we've done one already. Was there anything off of the uh, homework set, graphing-wise, that you wanted me to look at? No? Okay. So I'm just going to make one up kind of like I would if I were making a test, all right? So here we go. I want us to sketch um, f of x equals negative 2x squared mm, plus 4x plus 13. There we go. So we, we want to sketch this. So what would the first step be? Remember, I, I think we came up with a six-step process for this. So the first step is uh, determine if it opens up or down, right? This opens down because A is negative 2, right, which is less than 0. So we know that our graph looks like this. It has a maximum, right? Maximum height, maximum value. All right, second step. Determine the vertex. So now we figure out what H and K are. For H, I do negative B over 2 times A. Now, I didn't point out, but remember, this is A is negative 2, B is 4, and C is 13. Just make sure you pick up the signs of, of what the numbers are. So I made this real nice here, didn't I? Negative 4 over negative 4 is 1. And that's nice because it'll be easy to plug that in, won't it? But on the previous example, we saw that we had to like plug in 0.375. So be prepared to plug in a decimal if you need to and use your calculator. But for this, all I have to do is take my function and plug 1 in. And that should be pretty straightforward. Let's see. So I think I'm getting uh, negative 2 here, then plus 4, so negative 2 plus 4 plus 13. It's going to be 15. Just remember, you're squaring the 1, right? You're not squaring the negative 2. So the negative 2 is going to stay negative. All right, and so we've got our vertex. Our vertex is a point. It's the point 115. That's our vertex. And the third step, wasn't that the quick sketch? Just a real quick sketch to see what's going on here. If I go to the vertex, which is to the right one, and up 15, I'm going to be somewhere up there, right? It's going to open down, which means we're going to have two x-intercepts. That means it's worth us going and finding them. 
So I have two x-intercepts here. All right, what, what was step four? Find the x-intercepts, right? Now, if we didn't have any, we would skip this step, but we do. So to find them, I need to set the original function equal to zero. And again, you can, you can try and factor this, or you can use quadratic formula, right? So it's, it's going to require quadratic on this, I believe. So x is going to be negative b plus or minus square root b squared. So I'm using 4 for b, right? So negative b plus or minus square root of b squared. So 4 squared is 16 minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a, which is 2 times negative 2. So let's try this. Um, how many negative signs do you see here? You see two of them, right? So that's even, so that's positive. Does that help? Just do it that way? Okay. Negative 4 plus or minus square root. And now we're going to have 16 plus these multiplied together. So 8, 104. Is it 104? Okay, so 104 over negative 4. Yeah, so this is one of those spots where you want to be real careful. See these negative fours? Like, you do not want to cancel these, okay? It might be tempting to you to cancel these, but you can't do it. You have to wait till you resolve the entire numerator before you can divide by negative four. So we've got negative four plus or minus square root of 164. No, no, not even. Not even close. What is it, 120? Over negative four. And then root 120, you'll need your calculator for. Uh, 10.95, man, it's real close to 11, isn't it? It's not 11, though. Let's, just go, let's go with 10.95. So equals negative 4 plus or minus 10.95 all over negative 4. And then you have to do the two different answers, right? Does anyone have those yet? The two answers, no? Three point seven three. Okay, and then one point seven three negative. Okay, so I'm not showing this work, but are y'all comfortable with the idea of doing the, the plus and then the minus and then dividing through by negative four? Okay, so you do those two, and you should get these two answers. So we have our two x-intercepts. What is the fifth step? Uh, I think we had one more thing before sketch, y-intercept. And how do we find the y-intercept? Plug zero into the function. So just replace your x's with zero, and we should get that number out the, the back there, 13. So we know the point, which is the highest point on the graph. We know where the graph hits the x-axis and we know where the graph hits the y-axis. And that's all we need to draw this now. So we're just going to put our sketch together. And this is where I told you to just think a little bit about what you, you know, how you want to label your graph. My vertex has to be at 115, so to the right one and up 15. My x-intercepts are going to go between about, what, like, negative 2 and 4. And then my y-intercept is at positive 13. So I'm going I'm to do this. I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4 this way. 1, 2, 3, 4 that way. That makes sense how I'm coming up with that? And then up and down, I can probably squeeze it in here. I can probably do like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. I think that's enough. And then let's draw it. So start, start with your vertex. Put your vertex out there first. So go 115, put a dot. 
we'll label it. And then let's do our x-intercepts. So negative 1.73, if this is negative 1, this is negative 2, 1.73, I don't know, that good enough right there? Yeah. And we can label that negative 1.730, that's that point. And then the other one is 3.73, which is about right here, 3.730. And we have a y-intercept of 13. So here's 15, so 13's here, and you can just put 13 there, that's fine. You don't have to put, the, put it as a point. So that's all the information on the graph, right? My axis of symmetry, which we talked a little bit about, is right there. And I'm going to draw it on this side first, like this. And it should look like a mirror image of itself, so make, just make sure that's rounded, right? Something like that. There we go. So a good chunk of the test next week will be this stuff right here, all right? I, I can imagine asking you to graph at least two of these and then maybe two word problems. Um, the review had a couple of graphs, right? A couple of graphs and a couple of, did it have word problems? Yeah. Did? Okay. And then before that, there was the factoring part, right? So that's kind of, if you're looking at, you know, what's going to be on the test next week, we have factoring, and then we have the quadratics, uh, graphing them, and then doing some word problems, and then polynomials, and that's what we'll, I think we'll start that now. Sound good? Okay. <clears throat> so as a quick, a quick review, I'm going to ask you to recall some things here. Linear functions would look like this. Now normally when we wrote linear functions or linear equations before, we used y equals mx plus b. Remember that? We, but if we replace the y with f of x, that just tells us that it's a function. But that has the same format as y equals mx plus b, right? Okay, so that right there is a linear function. So as a, as a specific example of this, if we said f of x equals 3x plus 1, we should all be able to graph this. There were, multi, there were two different methods that we've talked about to graph something like this. You could find the x and y intercepts and draw a straight line, or you could do the, um, use the y-intercept and the slope to get a point and then rise over run to the next point and draw a line. Both ways will we'll draw the same line, right? Okay, so the method that we use to graph a line is pretty much established, right? We've got that? All right, so after we did linear functions, we just started talking about quadratic functions. And for a quadratic function, those look like ax squared plus bx plus c, right? A specific example of this would be like the one we just did. Negative 2x squared plus 4x plus 13, right? That's the one we just did. Now the steps to graph this are very different than the steps to graph this, right? So we have our own set of steps for that. Six step process if we want to graph it. And now what we want to do is we want to move on to the next category of functions which are called polynomial functions, all right? So we need to know what they look like like we know lines look like this, we know quadratics look like this, but what do polynomials look like? So a polynomial function right, here's what it looks like. Now before I put it, before I put it here, 
I just want to warn you that this is going to look very bad and, and don't freak out, all right? <laughs> In fact, you really don't even need to write this if you think it's going to make you throw up to see it. All right, there we go. That's what a polynomial fu function looks like. So it's what, A with a little subscript, that's an N, X to the N plus A, and then N minus 1, X to the N minus 1 plus A subscript n minus 2, x to the n minus 2, plus this, this is dot, 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 which means repeat, just continue this pattern until you get down to a subscript 1, x to the, what's the power on that? 1. one. And then plus, now there's no x's here, right? All right, so that looks terrible, doesn't it? Yes. That looks terrible. Let me give you a specific example of a polynomial function. And, and I'm actually going to talk a little bit about why that looks so bad, all right? Because there's a reason. All right, how about this? 3x to the 8th minus 4x to the 6th plus 5x um, to the 3rd plus 4x minus 7. All right. This is an example, a specific example of a polynomial function. So let's, let's try and identify some characteristics of this polynomial function. Notice that all of these terms, now remember terms are separated by addition and subtraction. Here I have a total of one, two, three, four, five terms, don't I? Each of these terms has a number and then x with a power, right? And that power has to be a non-negative integer. Now, what the hell is a non-negative integer? Non-negative means it can't be negative. Integer means that it's one of the counting numbers. So these powers up here, to be a polynomial, these powers have to be either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It could be any number as long as it's a counting number and it's not negative. Understand? That's what classifies it as a polynomial. So I, I have written this thing in, in what we refer to as descending order. So the highest power of x I have is to the eighth power, right? And then the next power, I don't have a seventh power here, do I? Okay, that's fine. It's still a polynomial. And then uh, this to the sixth power. Then I don't have a fourth power, right? I don't have a fifth power. Sorry, I don't have a fifth power of x. I don't have a fourth power of x, but I have a third power, right? Then I'm missing the, the squared, x squared. There's not, nothing here. Then there's x to the first power. And then there's a number by itself with no x. So can you kind of see like where things are matching up here a little bit? Like this right here is that, right? Okay, this right here is that one. So this formula, this formula, what this is saying is a sub n, it just says, hey, it's some number, okay? It's just some number in front of x to some power n. And then we should have another number sitting in front of x, but instead of to the power n, it should be n minus 1. So that should be, in our case, if this is 8, what should the next piece have? 7th power. But I don't see a 7th, do I? So let me rewrite this for you, and I'm actually going to make it appear. Just tell me if you agree with this or not. Okay, now, do you see that it matches up with that formula? I actually have all powers, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and no power, right? And in, in front of each of those x's, I have a number. In this case, it was 3, right? That gives me that. Since I didn't have an x to the 7th here, I need to put a 0 in front. That would kill that. This one I have, this one I don't, this one I don't. Do you see it? Okay, so what's important for us in a polynomial function is what this highest power is. Okay, so in our formula up here, it's this right here. This is called the degree of the polynomial. The highest power. The highest power is the degree. Another thing that's going to be very important to us in, a, in polynomial functions is this particular number. 
And that right there we call the leading coefficient. Ah. The leading coefficient. Believe it or not, the degree and the leading coefficient of a polynomial function tells us a whole lot about what this thing looks like when we go to graph it. Because remember, we have a set of steps to graph this, right? We have a set of steps to graph this. Ultimately, I want a set of steps to graph something like this. And the first piece of information we're going to use are those two pieces right there, the leading coefficient and the degree of the polynomial. Those two things will tell us a lot about the shape of the graph, all right? Now, can I go back and revisit why it is that we use this ridiculous notation of this subscripting? So let me, let me try and, let me try and uh, motivate this with an idea. If this is what a quadratic looks like, right? This is the general form of a quadratic. We use A, B, C for the numbers, right? So what if we went the next step up, which would be x cubed, right, instead of x squared? Then would you agree that maybe I could just say, hey, uh, it could look like this, like a general formula for something with x cubed would look maybe like that? Like all degree three polynomials could be written a x cubed plus b x squared plus c x plus d. Yes? Mm -hmm. And then maybe say, okay, for, for a fourth degree, maybe we could say the general form looks like this. Right? What's wrong with this? Why, why, is, why are mathematicians not happy using this notation and prefer to use this notation? Does any, some people see it, some people don't. What's that? That's right. How many do you have? You have 26 letters in the alphabet, right? What if your polynomial is a 100, 100 degree polynomial? What if it is? You're not going to be able to write as a x to the 100, b x to the 99, right, c x to the 98, because you're going to exhaust all your letters, right? So instead what we do is this. What's really happening here is, I'll do it right next to this here. Instead, mathematicians go like this and they say, all right, if you want the general form of a third degree like this, here's what we'll do. We'll say, instead of a, I'm going to write a sub 3 x cubed plus a sub 2x squared plus a sub 1x plus a sub 0. See, instead of using a, b, c, d, a, b, c, d, I'm using a subscript 3, a subscript 2, a subscript 1, a subscript 0. <laughs> Make sense? And then if I have a 100 degree polynomial, then I just put a sub 100. See, I'm never going to run out of subscript numbers. And plus dot, 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 et cetera. Is that rain? Is the power going to go out again? Come on, power. Come on, power. Oh, that's good. OK, so that's just a little random information. It's this, the way this looks is not to make you hate math more than you might already hate it. It's actually because we need a way to do it when, when we have polynomials that go beyond what our alphabet will allow us to do. And that's why in a lot of higher math, you see a lot of that subscripting. It's there because of that reason. OK, so get, do you have a basic idea of what they look like? Yes? OK, so let me ask you a question then. Is that a polynomial function? Yes, it is. What is the degree of that polynomial function? It's one. This is a degree one polynomial function. Okay, what about this one? Is this a polynomial function? Yes. Now specifically, it's a quadratic function, right? But this is also a polynomial function. It's a degree two polynomial. So what I'm, t what I'm telling you is that all lines are polynomials. And all quadratics are polynomials. But it, polynomials in general do not have to look like one of, they don't have to. I can give you something like this, and it does not look anything like a line or a quadratic. So it's kind of what, what I'm getting at is that if you take a big pot of all polynomial functions, 
lines are in there and quadratics are in there. They're, they're all included in that, in that group, okay? So we want a technique to be able to graph polynomial functions that are degree three and higher. Because for degree one and two, we're good, right? It's degree, degree three and higher, we need a technique. So that's what, it, that, that's what the rest of today is going to be about. How do we graph them? Well, what do they look like, right? So um, shape, shapes of polynomial functions. So what we want to talk about here is what do these things look like? What do polynomial functions look like? All right? What do they look like? And we're only going to be thinking about when the degree of the polynomial is two or higher. Because for degree one, what do they look like? Straight lines, right? But for degree two and up, they all have it, the same sort of basic characteristics. First, they're smooth. All right? That just means that when you draw them, you don't pick up your pencil and you don't have any jagged corners. Everything is smooth like a roller coaster, all right? Two, curved. See, I can't, I can't include a line here. That's why I said degree two and up, because lines, you wouldn't consider a line to be curved, right? So for degree two and up, it's curved. Like parabola has a curve to it, so smooth and curved. And then um, the last property is what we call the end behavior. The end behavior is what the graph looks like on its ends, like the left side and the right side. So for end behavior, you have actually one of four possible things that could happen with a polynomial function. You could have this happen. It could go up on the left and up on the right, like a parabola, right? See, but in the middle, I'm going to put a question mark. With polynomials in general, it might be doing something weird in the middle. But if you look at just the ends, either the left side and right sides both go up, or you could have the left side go down and the right side go down. And in the middle, it could be doing some weird wiggly stuff. But the ends either both have to go up, both have to go down. Or what else do you think? Up then down, up on the left, question mark, down on the right. Right? That could happen. And the last one would be down on the left, question mark, up on the right. So as we, as we graph polynomial functions, we need to understand that all of them, no matter what, as long as it's degree two and up, it's going to look like one of those four. Okay? We will have to determine that. Now, the good news for determining the end behavior is that we have a quick way of doing it. All right? So that's what I'm going to give you now. But this is the basic shape of the graphs. Um, some specific examples. I'll give you some specific examples of graphs. We could have a graph that looks like this. That's an example of a polynomial function. You could have a graph that goes like this. So the arrows just represent that it continues to do that. Just continues to go down and move to the left. This one continues to go up and to the right, all right? Um, so this one went down on the left and up on the right. This one went up on the left, up on the right. But see in the middle, they're doing different things, aren't they? Okay. All right, so now the next note is determining how to determine the end behavior. We use what's called the leading coefficient test.
So remember a second ago when I put these up here, I'm just going to put it back up here on the side. Remember I wrote this down, and then I had a bunch of other ugly stuff over here, and I said that these two things were important. This was the degree, and this right here, the number in front, was the leading coefficient. I'm going to call it LC from now on for leading coefficient, all right? I said these two things were important. Here's, here's why. It's this test we're going to run. So I'm going to draw something up here for you. It's, it's going to be a table that you can use as a reference. Makes this part easy. So up here, I'm going to put degree. And over here, I'm going to put um, LC, leading coefficient. So here's the way this table works. Just fill it out for now, and then we'll, we'll go over how you're going to use it. So just copy that up on the board. All right, so what we're going to do to use this little table is we're, we're going to have to look at the degree and the, the leading coefficient and just determine two things. Is the degree even or odd? And that will depend on what we're looking at, right? So we say, is it even or odd? If it's even, we're going to look down this column. If it's odd, we're going to look down this column. And then we're going to look at the leading coefficient. If the leading coefficient is positive, we're going to look across this row. If it's negative, we look across this row. All right, so now let me fill in the table. Oh, wait, I already messed that up. And then this. And then this. Remember we said we had the four possibilities, right? So I think the best way to see this is to just give you some examples, all right? So some examples. Find the end behavior of these. All right, f of x equals negative 3x to the fourth plus 4x squared plus 1. So this is a polynomial, right? Mm -hmm. And what is the degree of the polynomial? The degree is 4. And what are we interested when we're what are we interested in when we're looking at the degree of a polynomial in this test? If it's even or odd, right? So in this case, it's even. And I'm assuming everyone's comfortable with the idea even 2 4 6 8 10, right? Yeah. Okay. So that's an even number. All right. So that already tells us it's going to be one of these two, right? Now we have to look at the leading coefficient. The leading coefficient, LC, is equal to negative 3, right? That's the number in front. Now, when it comes to leading coefficients, we're not looking at even or odd anymore. We're looking at whether or not it's positive or negative. So in this case, it's negative, right? And that tells me that I have to be looking down the even column, right? And then the negative row, which means I have to be this, right? So it looks like this. So the answer you have for this, and the way that I would want you to put it on the test, is just to draw me that little thing like that. Show me that the left goes down, the right goes down, put a question mark in the middle. Do not write this, because you don't know what it does in the middle. All right? It may wiggle around. Now, if it's a parabola, yes, it looks like that. But this fourth degree polynomial does not have to look like this. Make sense? 